Hey AP Chemsters, this is Mrs. Vandewey bringing you another edition of the Blank Wall videos. This starts Chapter 2, Atoms and Elements. This first section, the first three sections actually, are really the history of the uh, atomic theory and where did this all begin. Uh, we'd like to let you know that this is not covered on the AP exam, it's just a background of how we know what we know today. So let's begin. The early laws, the law of conservation of mass, was actually introduced by Antoine Lavoisier. Uh, Lavoisier was a very interesting character in history. Uh, he is considered actually the, the father of modern chemistry. What happened is that he was of the French aristocracy at, at the wrong time, and he was actually beheaded in 17, uh, I think it was like 94, uh, with a lot of the other French aristocracy. And uh, of all the good things that he had done with chemistry and with science, that very quickly they beheaded him, and, and there went all that, that knowledge and, and the, the science. So kind of a sad story there. Uh, but before he was uh, guillotined, before he was beheaded, he did come up with a law of conservation of mass. And it says, in a chemical reaction, man is, mass is neither created nor destroyed. So hopefully you got this idea of an equation. The mass before is equal to the mass after. So I know we have not identified reactants and products yet, but you might remember that from your first year of chemistry. We can say the mass of the reactants will always equal the mass of the products. So let's look at problem number one. It says when a small log completely burns, the mass of the ash is much less than the mass of the log initially. What happened to the matter that composed the log? Why don't you pause this, think about it, write down an answer, and come back. All right, so let's kind of put this together. So what is it saying? It's saying that the mass of the log initial is greater than the mass of the ash after. So how can I make this inequality into an equality as up here? So in order to do so, I must consider, well, what's missing? What, what would be uh, part of the, the log that would make the, this mass equal? So in order to make this uh, consistent with the law of conservation of mass, notice I changed the inequality into an equal sign. So it's the mass of the ash after plus something else. Do you know what that something else is? When you burn anything, what do you typically make? Carbon dioxide, water vapor, maybe some incomplete combustion occurs. So you might have some carbon monoxide. You might have some uh, soot flying away, whatever. So this uh, question mark could be all that other stuff you can't mass when it's over with. Typically your gases will make up your missing mass. But there has to be something uh, else there to make the, the mass before equal the mass after. Okay, let's go on. So the law of definite proportions. Um, another chemist, another French chemist actually, uh, name of Joseph Proust, came up with uh, this idea. And of course, how, did, how did any of these folks come up with that? How did Lavoisier come up with the law of conservation of mass? How did Proust come up with the law of definite proportions? They did it through experimentation. So Proust was going through and he said that a, a given compound always contains exactly the same proportions of elements by mass. So let's just take water for example. Uh, water is h 2 well, and if you were to add up their masses, well, each, each hydrogen is 1, so 1 times 2 is 2, plus 16 is 18. So the, the mass of water is 18. If you take the proportion of, of oxygen, 16 over 18, that's 8 ninths. So if you have any sample of water, big sample, small sample, any sample, it will always be 8 ninths oxygen. That is your proportion of oxygen. Any sample of water will always have one-ninth of hydrogen or 2 over 18. So if you had a small sample of water, you weigh it out, we can say that 1 out of 9 grams will always be made up of hydrogen. 8 out of every 9 grams will be made up of oxygen. That would be the law of definite proportion. Think of what a proportion is. Um, so let's look at problem number two. When a gaseous mixture of hydrogen gas and gaseous chlorine react a product forms that has the same properties regardless of the relative amounts of hydrogen and chlorine used. How is this result interpreted in terms of the law of definite proportions? Pause this, think about it, jot something down, and we'll come right back. All right, so what did you come up with? So your product, which is going to be HCl, I don't know if you realize that or not, so... 
what does this mean that no matter what you are making you have a certain uh, portion, proportion of hydrogen to the exact proportion of chlorine. So if you have a small sample, a large sample, you'll always have that same proportion. If it has the same proportion, then it must be the same uh, compound if you have a lot of it or a little of it. Uh, so no matter how much of the hydrogen gas or chlorine gas you started with, you will always have the exact product with the exact same proportions. All right, so the next example really shows you this. So let's check this out. So this is two samples of carbon dioxide are decomposed to their constituent elements. One sample produces 25.6 grams of oxygen and the other one is 9.60 grams of carbon. The other produces 21.6 grams of oxygen and 8.10 grams of carbon. Show these results are consistent with the law of different proportion. I know I said that quickly. Let's kind of go back. What was this again? A given compound always contains, I'm up here, exactly the same proportions of element by mass. So think about what you're doing. We have to set up a proportion, a proportion by mass of the elements. So let's check this out. Uh, notice that in sample number one, they gave us 25.6 grams of oxygen and 9.6 grams of carbon. There's my proportion. And if you have a calculator handy, which I hope you do, what does that equal? Did you get 2.67? All right, so check this out, the next one. So you have another sample of carbon dioxide, which is a little smaller sample, and let's check out its masses. Here's my proportion of the elements by mass. Go back and look at that definition. You have 21.6 grams of oxygen and 8.10 grams of carbon. So if it's proportion, you can certainly divide that, and what do you get? Get out your calculators. What do you get? I sure hope you got that number again. Wow, what do you notice? They're the same number. Does that make sense? Go back and look. A given compound always contains exactly the same proportions, check that out, of elements by mass. So as long as we have carbon dioxide, any carbon dioxide, we'll always have this proportion by mass. Okay. Now look at number three, the law of multiple proportions. Uh, this one is actually credited with John Dalton. He was using the research of Lavoisier and of Proust and very shortly after came up with the law of multiple proportions. This is all about the same time in history. These were going very, very quickly. Once that Lavoisier was starting to establish uh, this law of conservation of mass uh, and the techniques in order to prove that, uh, all these laws came out very, very quickly. So here's Dalton's contribution. He said when two elements combine to form a series of compounds, the ratios of the mass of the second element that combine with one gram of the first can always be reduced to small whole numbers. Now what the heck does that mean? Uh, you need to have compounds that, let's say, H2O and H2O2, they both contain hydrogen and oxygen, but in uh, multiple proportions. In water, it's a 2 to 1 proportion, and hydrogen peroxide, it's a 1 to 1 proportion, or, you know, 2 to 2 anyway. So when two elements combine to form a series of compounds, so that was my example of water and hydrogen peroxide. It says the ratio of the mass of the second that combine with one gram of the first can always be reduced to small whole numbers. So let's see how problem number four helps. So go back and look here. The ratios of the masses of the second element that combine with one gram. So this example in problem number four is talking about nitrogen and oxygen. We have nitrogen dioxide and dinitrogen monoxide. So here we have the same two elements making different compounds. So it says that we have nitrogen dioxide contains 2.28 grams of oxygen for every one gram of nitrogen. Notice we needed that one gram. While dinitrogen monoxide contains 0.570 grams of oxygen for every one gram of nitrogen. There we go back to the definition. Show these results are consistent with the law of multiple proportions. So if I set the mass of oxygen. We already have one gram of nitrogen in the case, so I need to know about the grams of oxygen. So if I take the ratio, well, what's a ratio? It's like a fraction, isn't it? So if I were to do this, so here's the mass of the oxygen of compound one, and here is the mass of oxygen in compound, compound two. Uh, reduce that. What do you get? You still have your calculator, I hope. What do you get? You have four. Not about four, not around four, but exactly four. What does that mean? It's a whole number. 
Okay, so that's your law of multiple portion. Let's go on to the next page. All right, so here's Dalton again, and once again, yes, look at that. He's thinking once again, and um, he was putting together what he understood about these things called atoms uh, at this point. This is like early 1800s. I mean, I think like 1803 or something. It could be off a little bit by then, but early 1800s. So what did he come up with? He said, each element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. Do you remember how I defined atoms in the very first blank wall? I meant indivisible, undivided. So he is saying this circle is an atom of oxygen, this circle is an element of nitrogen. So that's the first one. Number two, the atoms of a given element are identical. But the atoms of one element are different than the other, uh, the atoms of the other elements. So all these three oxygen atoms are identical. All these three nitrogen atoms are identical, but these are not identical to each other. The reds are different than the blues. So the atoms of one element cannot be changed into atoms of a different element by chemical reactions. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed. So you cannot make oxygen uh, become nitrogen in a chemical reaction. They had to add that phrase uh, in, after the 19, early 1900s when they started working with um, radioactivity and whatnot where you actually they do become different atoms. But that's a whole other story. Uh, finally, compounds are formed when atoms of more than one element combined. A given compound always has the same relative number and kind. So here, this is a chemical reaction. Uh, they're formed when these uh, elements are combined. Uh, you always have the same relative. So notice we have one uh, nitrogen here, one nitrogen there, one oxygen, one oxygen. So let's check this out. We have two modifications. Um, well, the first one, it says extremely small particles called atoms. Well, remember what atom meant, indivisible. In the late 1800s, when J.J. Uh, Thompson came around, he discovered the electrons. Uh, later on, um, Rutherford discovered the proton, and um, so the subatomic particles were then discovered. Isotopes were also discovered. We don't haven't talked about that yet. You might remember iso, the prefix iso means the same as. So what's an isotope? It's the same element, but different um, number of neutrons, in a sense, or different atomic masses. So they have the same number of protons, different number of neutrons. So therefore, all these three atoms of oxygen may not be the same. So then we have Avogadro's hypothesis. Let's scroll up. Emil Avogadro, you might have recognized that word Avogadro. That's a special number. And actually, Avogadro did not come up with this number, but that 6.02 times 1023 was named in honor of Avogadro. So what was his hypothesis? That at the same temperature and pressure, equal volumes of different gases all contain the same number of particles. So I'm actually going to put this up here. This is Avogadro's hypothesis. What does that mean? N is the number of particles is proportional to its volume. So they're saying if the, the number of particles is 5 and the volume is 10, if I had 10 particles, the volume is 20. It's a proportion. That's what that's tell, telling you. Oops. Um, all right, that's better. So when a volume of hydrogen reacts with equal volume of chlorine, that's, that's important. When an equal volume of hydrogen reacts with the equal volume of chlorine, what does that mean according to Avogadro? Well, if it has equal volume, it's equal number of particles. So if you have the same number of H2s reacting with the same number of chlorines at the same temperature, what volume of product having the form of HCl is formed? Well, I know we haven't really talked about chemical formulas yet, but you can at least kind of think about that. So if these are the same number of particles, and this is what you get, look at that coefficient. So if I have equal... If I have one unit of volume here and one unit of volume here, I get two units of volume of HCl. So what volume of product uh, will you make? And so the answer actually is twice the volume of H2. So whatever you started with, if you have equal volumes of uh, hydrogen gas and chlorine gas, you have equal particles of hydrogen gas and chlorine gas, so you're going to have, uh, when you're done, twice the particles of HCl, so you have twice the volume. Uh, of, of H2. Then it says draw a particle diagram for this. And so, well, okay, here is my H2. Here is my chlorine. And notice what you get. You get two of those. So there's my particle diagram. 
All right, let's kind of go on to 2.4 so I don't take up too much more of your time. Uh, the discovery electron, like I told you uh, earlier that J.J. Thompson actually was the first one to dispel that Greek definition of the atom, which meant uh, you know, undivided or indivisible. He did divide the atom into subatomic particle of electrons. So what did he do? What's really kind of cool is um, he took this cathode ray tube right here, actually didn't look quite like this. This is more of a modern cathode ray tube. Uh, he had a different one which had a huge bulb at one end and it narrowed it down to the other end. And it's actually called a Crookes tube uh, after the, the guy who invented it. And so um, he applied a voltage to his Crookes tube and he was amazed at what happened. I don't know if you can really see in your picture, but there is a line right here. And this greenish glow uh, was produced. This, this ray was produced at the negative electrode. And he then thought, wow, this is really cool. I want to experiment with this. And so he, one of the things he tried amongst many, many things was he put a, a magnet to it, um, or excuse me, electric field, which is like a magnet. So if he put a, a negative um, pole and he put this electric field in it, this ray was deflected away from um, this magnetic field. And so what was he concluding? Well, what will repel a negative is another neg negative. So he said these rays must be a stream of negative particles that he called electrons. Okay, uh, Probably most of you don't have the old-fashioned uh, big fat TVs. Uh, you probably have more of those skinny ones. And those fat TVs would have electro or, uh, cathode ray tubes in them as well and was part of the mechanism of the TV. But I don't know if you're very familiar with them anymore. All right, we're almost done. Let me uh, switch to the next picture. Now notice uh, the next one is Robert Milliken. He's one of the few American scientists that we actually talk about in this uh, section. Uh, he was actually uh, a professor at the University of Chicago. And shortly after J.J. Thompson announced his discovery of electrons, he thought, well, that's pretty darn cool. Uh, he wanted to know a couple things about these electrons. He wanted to know their mass and he wanted to know their charge. Uh, so he designed what's called an oil drop experiment, which is a very, very uh, simplistic uh, set up here and he had to have an unbelievable amount of patience to actually run successful experiments doing this but so what what really happened is that here is this area that uh, he could charge and he would have certain voltages applied uh, here and and he by changing the voltage he can change really how negative they are and what he would do is that he would spray these oil drops which are very, very fine mist. It's like your grandma's perfume bottle. And um, he had a way to uh, negatively attract those um, oil droplets. So when he put them in here, uh, these now have electrons added to them. And he could really determine through this fine balance, basically, by changing the voltage down here, he could determine the charge and the mass. And what is really, really crazy is that using this very crude piece of apparatus, he came up with amazingly um, precise numbers. So he determined the mass of electrons 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. That's not much. He found the charge of electron is negative 1.6 times to the negative 19th coulombs, uh, which again is a very, very small amount. But the idea that behind this simple mechanism he was able to come up with those numbers is amazing. So in number six, let's use our new knowledge of how to factor label and do number six. So we're going to factor label. Suppose one of Millikan's oil drops has a charge of negative 4.8 times to the 19th coulombs. How many excess electrons did that drop have? So when he passed it through, I think some radium actually is how he was able to get some electrons to jump on those uh, oil droplets. You know, how many electrons jumped on that through uh, that, that process? So what are we looking for? Question mark? Oh, question mark what? How many excess electrons? So, oops, I'm sorry. How many electrons... Stop that. Hang on. So how many electrons does it have? Well, what's my given is negative 4.8 times 10 to negative 19 coulombs. Well, what do I need to do next? I need to do my little number line or my line here. And what should I put on the bottom? That's always your important first step. Well, what unit is this? Coulombs. Do I know anything about coulombs up here? Here it is. So I can put negative 1.6 times 10 to the 19th coulomb in the bottom. And what's that equal to? The charge of one electron. 
So notice what happens. Our coulombs cancel out. And I can do our math. Look at 10 to the negative 19th cancels out. Our negatives cancels out. So what am I left with? What's 4.8 divided by 1.6? And that's equal to 3 electrons. And that's all we have. And we will do 2.5 tomorrow.